Hi, it's Dwyer, gamblersadvisory.com, a free site, bettingangle.us, a free site. Let's talk about the unification match. The fight for the undisputed championship at 154 pounds between Jamel Charlo and Brian Castano. Right, both guys come in. Charlo has most of the belts. Castano has a belt. Castano's also unbeaten. The only blemish on his record was a draw with Arislandi Lara that, quite frankly, many think he won. Understand the styles here, right? Charlo is low volume. He's episodic. He's what I call an ambush fighter. Castano is a skillful stalker, right? This is the intelligent front foot. He doesn't rush in the pocket with volume. No, he's coming forward, getting you to back up, waiting for his moment to come inside. The pressure is constant. Well, folks, they fought to a split draw. Let me just say, I lost, betting-wise, on this fight. I had the underdog. Brian Castano, right? We'll talk about it. I had the underdog, Brian Castano. And in hindsight, I should have spent a little bit extra money to win the bet if it went to a draw. But let's talk about the fight. At the risk of engaging in hyperbole, this fight is one of the best fights of this era. Understand the stage at 154 pounds couldn't have been bigger. This was for the undisputed championship. Let me also say too that the fight featured some situations that are unique to boxing. Let me tip my hat right here to the relationship between Derek James, the trainer of Jermel Charlo, and Jamel Charlo, right? Derek James was comfortable enough in his position, in his authority, to tell his fighter he was losing the fight. Derek James was comfortable enough in his position to tell his fighter that he needed a knockout to win the fight going into the last round. This fight will have some Things we will wonder about. And by the way, for the time being, the fight is in my favorites folder for those who want to take a look. Right? You want to do so sooner rather than later. This fight has some questions that we'll be asking ourselves as we look at the film of this fight going forward. Right? One of the big questions I have is a question Al Bernstein had during the telecast. Why isn't Brian Castano throwing more jabs? Why isn't he jabbing his way in? Why is there so much deference given to Jermel Charlo's right hand, which I'm personally not sure Charlo can throw with accuracy if you crowd him or have him on his back foot? Right, so there's Castano. He's coming inside. The pressure is constant. He's masterful at it. If you want to know how to cut off the ring, if you want to know how to get a taller opponent backing up to set up a great visual for you of the taller guy going up against the ropes, Castano's fight style is the fight style to look at. But what I didn't understand is that Castano's jab lines up with Charlo's right hand. The hand that was giving Castano problems is Charlo's other hand, the counter left hook. That's the punch that gives Castano problems. So I was wondering, since the slow rounds actually favored Charlo, and I know that sounds odd to a lot of people, 
We'll talk about my scorecard round by round here. But since the slow rounds favored Charlo, I was wondering why Castano didn't just jab. To be more active in the slow rounds, as well as to soften the road inside. Now as for Charlo, and I encourage people to look at the tape, if a guy is on his front foot as relentlessly as Castano is, and I don't mean that he's rushing in, I mean he's not backing up, he's applying the pressure, he has Charlo backing up, and Charlo, by the way, is oblivious to the visual. Right? I understand a guy being comfortable with his back up against the ropes if he's fighting a George Foreman. If he's fighting a Marcus Maidana. Right? A guy his size. But taller fighters need to realize that when they're fighting a shorter guy, it's a bad visual when the shorter guy, think by Tyson or whoever, has you with your back up against the ropes. Well, one of the biggest mysteries in this fight is why didn't Charlo clinch more? Folks, there's hardly any clinching in the fight. In other words, rather than back up to the ropes, as Castano is coming inside, if you're tired of trying to circle him, Use lateral movement, right? If you get tired of that, why don't you just lean forward and clinch him, right? It was interesting because Charlo, at different times, and of course I'm getting calls here, Charlo, at different times, abandons his jab, right? Which is a bit surprising given that Castano is standing there, applying pressure, psychological pressure, right, threatening to come inside. But not only is Charlo not shooting a jab a lot, Charlo himself isn't moving forward to tie up Castano. So instead, you have sustained periods of time in this fight where Castano has Charlo backing up and then is standing there, just waiting for the moment to take the next step forward. Right? It almost looked like you were watching someone in a horror movie. Right? The guy is stalking you down. He's two rooms over. He's one room over. You know, you know he's right in the doorway. And he's not going to leave you unless something happens. Well, understand, Charlo, and it's an interesting decision, instead of pumping a jab rhythmically, living off a jab and trying to move away but make the guy pay for coming forward, or trying to jump in the pocket, right? After all, that's his game, ambush fighter. Jump in the pocket. And roughhouse, a guy who isn't known for having that big a punch. Understand, Charlo's a taller man, right? He's fighting a guy who doesn't have the punch he has. Rather than make this a rough and tumble affair, Charlo instead is on his back foot deciding to box, deciding to lead with power shots at times. Letting Castano throw a combination. Castano's a combination puncher in the second round. Hoping to see an opening, which he gets, to throw a counter left hook, which hurts Castano. So let's talk about the scoring of this fight. And let's talk about some big moments in the fight. I believe they're so big, I believe it's career defining. Let me also make a point here. You know, sometimes the biggest fights in a fighter's career have him losing. But yet, the guy's profile is enhanced to the point where the loss helps his Hall of Fame credentials. 
Now, going into this fight, Jamel Charlo was a longtime champion at 154 pounds. Right? He was the more authentic title holder at 154 compared to Castano. Right? Jamel Charlo had been champion longer. Jamel Charlo was the one who fought people like Erickson Lubin, Jason Rosario. Right? Jamel Charlo had proven himself, but he needed that big fight to convince us that he's a Hall of Famer. I believe he got that fight by being in this fight, which I consider to be a great fight. Right? This is like Hearns Hagler, in a sense, where it's the audacity. You look back on that fight, Hagler closes Hearns out in three rounds, but it's just the audacity of Thomas Hearns fighting Hagler. And then Thomas Hearns in the first round doing what few ever tried to do against Hagler. Tries to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with Hagler and blow him out. Now here, what we learned about Jamel Charlo is having multiple belts for him wasn't enough. He wants to be great. This is different than his brother. Let me take a slap at Jamal Charlo. Right? We hear Jamal talking about how he wants Golovkin and how he wants this and how he wants that. We don't actually see him in the ring against a Demetrius Andre or even against a Golovkin. Right? By contrast, Jamel Charlo had belts and was unsatisfied. He wanted to be great. So he decides to fight for the undisputed title against unbeaten Brian Castano, even though the styles don't mesh. Now, I had Castano in the fight. Um, we'll just say, looking at the rounds, that I have no problem with the draw. Other than the financial problem of losing the bet, I have no problem with the draw. Let's talk about the rounds. I thought the first round is a Castano round. Right? Low action, but hey, the scoring matters. I thought Castano has Charlo backing up a bit. I thought Castano had the greater ring generalship. Then we get to the second round. And Castano, at this point, is more on his front foot. There's the exchange, and it's one of the big exchanges of the fight. I would argue the second round is perhaps Charlo's best round. But it shows the strategy. Charlo's going to sit back, let Castano crash the pocket, wait for an opening, then throw a power shot, trying to catch Castano with a counter. Then follow up as Castano is hurt and backing away. Right? Understand, Castano is a tale of two fighters. He's not close to the same fighter, backing away as he is coming forward. Right? When Castano's on his back foot, he's hurt, folks. He's in survival mode. Second round's a big round, in my opinion, for Charlo. So then we get to one of two wobbler rounds in the fight. The third round. If you're going to look at two rounds in this fight, I encourage you to look at the third round and the eleventh round. Right? If you have an argument with the scoring, those are the two rounds to look at. In the third round, with a bet on Castano, I watched Jermel Charlo continue the momentum that he picks up in the second round, which he won. So Jermel Charlo seems to have the third round in the bag. Until Brian Castano, in something like the last 15 to 20 seconds, rallies in such a way that he wins the round. 
Now, let me just say, when you're the favorite, right, no one roots for Goliath other than gamblers on Goliath, right? No one roots for Goliath. So as you look at the fight, knowing that Jermel Charlo was the favorite, the third round is jarring. In other words, you watch Jamal Charlo win the second round, you see him off to a good start of the third round, and you think, okay, this is a Jamal Charlo fight. Jamal Charlo has handled the aggression and has been able to counter with power shots, and now he's showing you that he's the guy with a very stiff jab when he throws it and more power and of course the timing the counter but then when the underdog and i know castano is unbeaten but he's the underdog in this fight when the underdog starts to make the favorite look bad we all want to root for david in the abstract Maybe the third round is a Charlo round. Maybe. I gave it to Castano based on the ending of the round where he hurts Charlo. Charlo looks bad off. Because we haven't seen Charlo bad off that often in his career, it's jarring. So we get to the fourth round. David has taken over. I thought the fourth round is a Castano round. But then we get to the fifth and sixth rounds. Now, I know many people are saying Castano got ripped off. Folks, in the middle of this fight, Jamel Charlo, after losing the third and fourth rounds, reestablishes himself in the fifth and sixth rounds. Castano closes better at the end of the sixth round. The visual favors Castano at times because it's a shorter guy backing up a taller guy. It's the underdog, different dynamic, backing up the favorite. It's Castano, closer to the middle of the ring. It's Charlo up against the ropes, right? So if you're just looking at the visual, and not the punches landed, not the clean counters. Castano looks like he's winning the fight. But Charlo's actually landing some clean counters. Right? There's a cat and mouse game going on here. Charlo's not back up against the ropes just turtling. No, Charlo is back up against the ropes and he's throwing punches. I thought Charlo wins the fifth and sixth rounds. Then disaster strikes for Charlo. Castano takes the seventh round, takes the eighth round, takes the ninth round. Now folks, at this point, it's clear that if this dynamic continues, Brian Castano is going to be the undisputed champ at 154 pounds. Not only that, let's add up the rounds. If I gave Castano the first round, and the third round, and the fourth round, and the seventh, eighth, and ninth rounds, in a 12-round fight with no knockdowns, that's six rounds for Castano. Right now we're heading into the 10th, 11th, and 12th rounds. You're thinking, okay, this is Castano's fight. He's alert. He's not hurt at the end of the ninth round. He's won six rounds. Right? The visual favors him because there's not a lot of clinching. The tall guy is backed up against the ropes. Jamel Charlo is low volume. He's not jabbing enough. Right? He hasn't turned this into, you know, either a match where he's circling Castano. Right? Or one where he's grappling with Castano. 
Instead, he's constantly back up against the ropes. His own corner senses the problem he's having. Derek James is pleading with his fighter to fight in the middle of the ring. Right? Understand, there's some great fights in history. The Rocky Marciano, Ezard Charles, first fight, where against a front foot heavy guy like Rocky Marciano, Ezard Charles's back doesn't touch the ropes, according to legend, until the last round or something like that. Right? Well, here, Charlo's living off on the side by the ropes. So at this point, you're thinking, okay, Castano is going to be undisputed. Then we get to a career-defining round. An argument can be made. Hell, I'll make it. That this is the most important round of Jamel Charlo's career. He's lost the prior three. He's down six rounds to three. He comes out for the 10th round. He's shooting a jab. He is showing hand speed. He reminds you at a desperate moment in the fight, in a round that he could not afford to lose, he reminds you that he is Jermel Charlo. I thought the 10th round was major. I thought given the ebb and flow of this fight, that 10th round, you're going to be hard-pressed to find a more important round this calendar year. It's that important. Understand, I believe this fight is going to age tremendously well. If you're a fan of Jamel Charlo, or if you're just a fan of boxing, the idea of a champion in a unification match down by three rounds, coming out in the 10th round and showing the patience and boxing skills that Jamel Charlo does after losing the preceding three rounds deserves a wow. I gave Jamel Charlo the 10th round. We get to the 11th round. Now, I thought Castano had the 11th round in the bag. I thought he had the undisputed title at 154 in the bag until the last 15 to 20 seconds of the round. This is the analog to the third round. Those are the rounds I think observers should look at with a microscope, revisit, right? Let me also point out too that judges score rounds in the moment. Let's just say Jamel Charlo in the last 15 to 20 seconds of the 11th round may have stolen the round. He clearly wins the 12th round. The reason I don't have a problem with the draw is because down six rounds to three on my scorecard, in a moment of desperation, Jamel Charlo somehow found a way against a front foot heavy fighter to win the 10th, 11th, and 12th rounds. Folks, the fight was that good. I don't have a problem. Again, other than a financial one. But I don't have a problem with neither guy losing this fight. I believe by being a part of this epic, a unification match, I believe Jamel Charlo right now has really put himself in the Hall of Fame. Because whatever happens to Jamel Charlo, and for his sake, I hope Brian Castano goes on to have a great career, right? Understand, the Floyd Mayweather resume, an argument can be made that the best thing to happen to Floyd has been the subsequent career Canelo has gone on. Right? You look at Canelo's record and you say, oh, that one loss, that's Floyd Mayweather. 
right? You see Canelo destroying guys in weight classes Floyd was never in, right? Middleweight, super middleweight, light heavyweight. And you think, wow, this guy lost to Floyd. Well, understand, if Brian Castano, who's an excellent fighter, continues to win fights, and this is a guy who beat Errol Spence in the amateurs, right? This is a guy who beat the Revianchenko in the amateurs. If Brian Castano goes on to great things, right? And he's fighting big names, right? Draw with Lara, draw with Charlo. It's not like Castano's not fighting big names. If he goes on to big things, this is just going to further reinforce the boldness and the gamesmanship Jamel Charlo showed in taking this fight, right? I applaud boxing for this. I thought the fight was epic. I believe hardcore fans need to find a tape of this fight if you missed the fight. This was one of the better fights especially given the situation involved. It was for an undisputed championship. Let me also say too, you know, some fighters would have wilted going into the 10th round if they were Jamal Charlo, the favorite. And this underdog guy has you backing up has hit you with some hard shots. I'm telling you the last, you know, the closing of the third round, Jamel Charlo doesn't look good. I'm telling you there are parts of round seven, eight, and nine where Jamel Charlo does not look good. Understand, I'm not alone in that assessment. His own corner told him, you need a knockout to win the fight. His old corner told him earlier, you're behind in the fight. Right, think about it. So what does Jamel Charlo do? He certainly wins rounds 10 and 12. I'll leave it up to you, the viewer, as to whether he wins round 11, right? This is a great split draw. I applaud both fighters. Um, I hope both guys take a breather, right? Because a fight like this, Castano got hit with several bombs, right? Several bombs. I like the idea of fighters being able to recover, right? Um, if they want to do a rematch, I'm not going to complain about it. But if I were these guys, I would take a breather. I would take some time off, right? They've already given fans a great match for the undisputed title at 154 pounds. I have no problem whatsoever since both of these guys are championship level. With Jamel Charlo and Brian Castano each holding a portion of the belt at 154. Let me also say too that we had a fight for the unified title at 140. Right? That Josh Taylor won. I thought Taylor won that fight by more than the scorecard showed, right? The idea that that fight was supposed to be a draw outside of the knockdowns, multiple knockdowns, was a bit ridiculous and unfortunate. Here, I believe it's clear. Jamel Charlo needed the late rounds to get back in this fight, right? This wasn't a situation where a Josh Taylor, by comparison, only had to make it to the finish line to win the undisputed title because he was ahead of the fight. No, this was a situation where Jamel Charlo didn't have the luxury. He had to keep his foot on the gas. And I believe Brian Castano, who's front foot heavy, who's a skillful stalker, right? I believe Brian Castano was trying to win the later rounds. He didn't give them away. He was trying to win the later rounds. I thought he comes damn close to winning the 11th round, but just 
couldn't close the show. Great fight. Let me hear from you. I understand it's a controversial fight. Let me know your scoring. Let me know how you saw the fight. Let me know you you know what you think the mistakes are. I thought Castano not throwing more jabs was a mistake. I thought Charlo not throwing more jabs, not clinching enough was a mistake. One of the best things Mayweather, younger Mayweather, not the older Mayweather who's up against the ropes with Ricky Hatton, who's up against the ropes with Marcus Maidana. I thought one of the best things that Floyd Mayweather would do is a fighter would come up and would be on his front foot. And Mayweather would keep them on his shoulder. A good example of this is Mayweather against Shane Mosley. When Mayweather gets his knees buckled. But while Mayweather is hurt, he doesn't back up. Right? He doesn't want Shane Mosley, who can punch, walking him down while he's hurt. So Mayweather does things like he has Mosley on his shoulder. He grabs Mosley's arm to slow him down. In other words, he doesn't have to have the visual of being chased by Shane Mosley. He knows how to clinch Mosley in the middle of the ring. Right? Sure, Mayweather lost that round. Right? But at the same time, it didn't set up the dynamic of the other man getting you up on the ropes, throwing volume at you, working you over, right? I think what Jamel Charlo and his team are going to have to look at is the bad visual, right? Because there's some rounds in here, fifth and sixth rounds, where Castano looks to be walking down Jamel Charlo. The visual's bad until you look at the punches. Also, if I'm Brian Castano, I have to go back through Jamel Charlo fights. And I'm going to have to ask myself, can Jamel Charlo throw that right hand when he's crowded? Can he throw the right hand in a phone booth? Is he as good throwing counter right hands as he is throwing counter left hands? If he's not, Castano should have used his left hand more. That's how I see it. Let me hear from you. I hope you leave your comments in the comment section of this video. Thanks for stopping by.